Near the end of the Great Depression in 1937 in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, 20-year-old Joseph Felix Chambier, often referred to as Joe, found work as a Western Union delivery boy. He met a woman named Garnett Olery, who was similar to Joe in the sense that they both lacked strong bonds to their families. Garnett and Joe fell in love with each other and went on to get married. After two months of marriage, Garnett discovered she was pregnant. On June 16, 1939, Joe was surprised at work when a co-worker informed him that Garnett had unexpectedly gone into labor. Joe and Garnett were informed that they should expect at least another three weeks of pregnancy. So he rushed home and leaped up the stairs with excitement about the birth of their child. When their daughter arrived, the couple was filled with joy. Joe described the situation like receiving a package sent from heaven. After the doctor inspected the newborn, he stated that the girl was in good health. Following the birth, Garnett spent an hour holding and talking to her daughter. But then, Garnett started feeling a bit tired and asked Joe to take their daughter. Joe took her and created a makeshift cradle out of the bottom drawer of their dresser and set their child there. Garnett fell asleep, but after she awoke, she started saying some strange things. Garnett asked Joe to make sure that if anything were to happen to her, that Alice Miller gets the baby. Alice was an elderly neighbor that lived north of the couple. She was also a close family friend. Then at 4pm, Garnett suddenly just passed away. Joe was so shocked at this and at first thought it was some sick joke since her last request was so strange, but after several failed attempts of trying to wake his wife up, it was clear that all of this was really happening. He was filled with immense dread. His mind then set itself on Garnett's final wish. Now, Joe's gut feeling was telling him not to actually follow through with this request as it just seemed so strange, but he did eventually give in. Joe brought his baby daughter named Alberta Elaine to Alice Miller. Obviously, it was very tough for him to give up his daughter, but he did feel a slight sense of relief knowing that Alberta would be nurtured and raised well. He believed Alice was conscientious, loving, and smart. Joe left believing that Alberta couldn't be left in better hands. Keep in mind, this was in 1937, so jobs were scarce. Or at least good ones that Joe was eligible for were anyway. So Joe decided to head back to his hometown in search of work, New England. But despite the distance, Joe managed to occasionally visit his daughter. In late 1941, one week before Pearl Harbor, he enlisted and joined the Army Air Corps in New Hampshire. Joe believed that this was his best chance at securing a future for Alberta. He was assigned to basic training in Fort Devens, Massachusetts, and was then shipped out to the Pacific Theater. During his time in service, he kept this tiny book with him. Inside it was the only picture of Alberta that he had. During his time in the military, Joe attempted to reach the Millers through letters, but never received a response. In August 1943, he suffered a head injury during air raid drills in the Panama Canal Zone. This led to ongoing neck and back pain. Following treatment, he was transferred to a Boston hospital in 1944. During this trip, Joe was actually able to visit an airport and get a flight to Pittsburgh. During a short layover, Joe was able to call Alice in order to check on Alberta, who was now 5 years old. However, instead of Alice picking up the phone, a woman that he didn't recognize answered it, informing him that he was believed to have been deceased. Furthermore, Alberta had been legally adopted, and her adoption records were sealed. The woman on the other end even accused Joe of abandoning his daughter before hanging up. Joe just stood there, mouth agape, trying to digest all of this information. Despite his efforts, he was unable to locate Alberta. In 1946, Joe remarried and settled in White River Junction, Vermont, working as a clerk at the Veterans Administration. Then, whenever Christmas was nearing, Joe would pose as Santa. Now, to my understanding, local families asked Joe to call them at night and then speak with their kids. This was obviously just to get children excited about the holidays and sell the illusion that Santa was real. Joe calling these various families became pretty popular and a Apparently, a newspaper article about this started to catch fire across the US, and people from all over were now requesting to speak to Santa Claus, or Joe. This became a regular thing for him every holiday season, and it brought Joe a lot of joy since it sort of helped fill that void of missing out at being a father for Alberta. And over all of these years, Joe was still searching for his daughter. He wanted to find her and explain that he didn't abandon her. 
Fast forward to around the late 80s, this case about Joe looking for his lost daughter actually received a segment on the Unsolved Mysteries TV series. Then, not too long after this episode went live, a woman from Seattle, Washington stated that she thinks she's Joe's daughter. The woman stated that she was adopted and her adoptive parents referred to her previous caretaker as Mrs. Miller. But after some DNA tests, it turned out that this woman was not Alberta Elaine. Then, in 1990, a genealogical researcher named Nancy Bartu stumbled upon an article sharing Joe's search for his daughter. Nancy was moved by this story and wanted to help, but she was not convinced that Alberta Elaine was adopted. Reason being was because in order for Alberta to be adopted, Joe's permission would need to be granted, and since he was in the military at the time, he was very easy to track down, so this shouldn't be an issue. But as we all know, Joe never approved of this. Nancy continued her investigation and found a potential match. She came across a marriage license stating that one Alberta was married to a man named Arthur Depew. Alberta was 17 when she married 25-year-old Arthur in February of 1990. Furthermore, the license stated that Alberta's father's first name was Felix, and he had died. It even said that her father was Canadian. But Joe's first name was obviously not Felix, it was his middle name, and he was not Canadian. But after being told that it was believed Joe had died, Nancy believed that all of this information was falsified. Nancy and Joe continued digging, trying to get into contact with Alberta herself. Nancy was able to get the contact information belonging to Arthur's mother, who was living in New York. She called her, expecting to finally end the search, but unfortunately, Nancy received some heartbreaking news. Arthur's mother said that Alberta had died in a terrible explosion in a vehicle back in July of 1957 five months after marrying Arthur. Apparently, that day, Arthur had told Alberta to meet him so that they could have a discussion about their relationship. Turned out that the two had actually separated weeks before. But the story gets even more insane. So after Alberta agreed to meet with Arthur, Arthur led her into this 1954 light green Plymouth. Arthur opened the passenger side door for Alberta to take a seat before getting into the driver's side himself. It's believed that Arthur initiated conversation, and it didn't turn out well. Arthur and Alberta's discussion quickly devolved into a heated argument, leading to Arthur touching together two wires which set off an explosion, ending not only both of their lives, but also the life of an 8-year-old girl walking near the car. Turned out that Arthur had a plan set up where if Alberta and he couldn't get back together, he would blow up the car with dynamite that he planted inside under the seats. Both Joe and Nancy were able to find out enough information about Alberta to confirm that this was indeed Joe's daughter, which was a bittersweet end to the search that Joe set out on. While he was glad that he finally found an answer, he was heartbroken that his daughter died thinking that her father had left her. As for Alberta's adoption, it was stated that she was never legally adopted. Obviously, there are still holes that draw a lot of confusion in this case, but the main question has been answered. As for Alice Miller, I wasn't really able to find out what happened to her, but obviously most people would suspect that she either died or just moved away, hence why that other woman was in her house. So at some point, Alice gave up Alberta for whatever reason, and according to an assistant police chief, Alberta ended up in the hands of a woman named Grace Williams. Joe later passed away at 80 years old in April of 1997. On Tuesday, January 27, 1976, Kyle Klinkscales spent the afternoon at his parents' home in LaGrange, Georgia. The 22-year-old was a junior at Auburn University and commuted to LaGrange twice a week to work as a bartender at the Moose Club. He left his parents' house around 4 p.m. that day and arrived at work shortly after. After finishing his shift at 11 p.m., Kyle said his goodbyes and headed to the parking lot. He unlocked his 1974 Ford Pinto and headed home. His manager saw him get in and drive off. However, Kyle never made it back to his apartment. Kyle had a roommate named Phil Langford, but due to their varying schedules, it was normal for the two to not see each other at all for several days at a time. And as a result, Phil had no idea that something was wrong when Kyle wasn't at the apartment. But Kyle's parents did suspect that something had happened after not hearing from their son for a couple of days. But being that he was in college, they thought that Kyle was simply busy with his classes. 
Back to that Tuesday evening when Kyle visited his parents' home. He left behind some clothes that his mother, Mary Louise, was cleaning. Kyle had told his mother that he would be back on Friday to pick up the clothing since he needed them for work, but he never went to grab them. This caused Kyle's dad, John, to call the Moose Club to see if Kyle ever showed up for work, but he was told that Kyle had the night off. Initially, John was really concerned, but then he remembered that Kyle told him he was going to Gainesville, Florida to watch a basketball game. This provided both John and Mary Louise with some sense of relief as they assumed that Kyle was simply spending his weekend there and would call them once he got back to Georgia. The following Tuesday rolled around and Mary Louise eagerly waited for her son to pull up to the driveway to pick up his clothes for his shift that night. However, as the evening passed, it became apparent that something was wrong and he was not going to show up. She called the club only to be told that Kyle hadn't shown up for work. The realization hit Mary Louise that no one had heard from Kyle since that last Tuesday night, and he had been missing for a week without anybody realizing. Panic began to set in. Worried about his son's whereabouts, John promptly contacted the LaGrange Police Department to report Kyle missing that afternoon. As investigators delved deeper, they discovered that Kyle had been in an irritable mood when he left from work the previous Tuesday night. Despite his usual pleasant nature with customers, Kyle had been visibly angry after an encounter with a troublesome individual. The manager thought that Kyle might have had a couple of drinks afterwards to ease himself, but he didn't exhibit signs of intoxication. After learning about Kyle's alcohol consumption before his disappearance, investigators theorized that he might have been in an accident on his way home. State police in both Alabama and Georgia conducted extensive searches along the routes Kyle might have traveled that night, but found no indications of a vehicle leaving the road. Near the roads was a body of water called the Chattahoochee River, so people started thinking that Kyle may have ended up there, but this was quickly ruled out as the river was only ankle deep. There were no signs of foul play, but Kyle's parents were adamant that their son wouldn't just disappear without reason, which is what investigators started suggesting. They believed that Kyle may have just wanted a change of pace and went off to start a new life. It was hypothesized that Kyle may have run off because of his distaste towards college. Apparently, his recent grades weren't great and he was only in college because of his parents. But according to Kyle's friends and family, if Kyle really wanted to skip college, he was the kind of person to just outright say it, and his family would be the type of people to support him regardless of his choice. So those that were close with Kyle were certain that he he did not simply run away. Furthermore, there were a lot of things that Kyle was looking forward to in the summer, such as the softball league he and his friends signed up for that he said he was really excited about. Kyle also had two cats that he deeply loved, and it was tough for his roommate Phil to imagine that he would just leave them. Authorities questioned all of Kyle's co-workers as he was last seen at the restaurant. One of the waitresses shared that Kyle appeared annoyed, which was unusual. The waitress simply assumed that this was because Kyle had to deal with a rude customer. She went over to Kyle and asked if he was okay, and Kyle simply nodded and told her he's fine, and that he would tell her more later. Days and weeks began to pass as no significant leads popped up in Kyle's disappearance. A new theory arose from his friends, suggesting that perhaps Kyle picked up a hitchhiker the night he disappeared. Kyle was friendly, so this wouldn't be an odd move for him. Authorities looked into this possibility and stated that it's definitely possible, but they had no evidence to support it. Kyle's vehicle was never found and it was listed as stolen in national databases. Investigators would eventually stop actively searching for Kyle, but his parents never gave up. They frequently purchased ad spots in newspapers requesting information regarding their son. Kyle's father, John, was beginning to hope that Kyle did simply run away due to the stress of college as that would be a much better fate than being dead. But as months started to pile on, John started to think that that was becoming less and less likely. Then, all of a sudden, the case got its largest development. In May 1987, over a decade after Kyle went missing, a man walking his dogs found an Exxon credit card that belonged to Kyle. It was located south of LaGrange, specifically near Flat Shoal Creek. And here's the interesting thing. The credit card was in immaculate condition despite Kyle being missing since 1976. 
The card also expired three years before Kyle disappeared, but this was explained by his parents later on. According to John, Kyle's wallet had been stolen at some point and this credit card was likely in it. But on the other hand, Kyle's mother stated that it wasn't abnormal for Kyle to hold on to expired credit cards, so it's entirely possible that this expired card was with Kyle when he went missing. Investigators searched the area where the card was found for any other traces of Kyle himself, but they found nothing and the case yet again went cold. A tip that was received in 1996 suggested that Kyle had been murdered and his body disposed of in a hole behind a local residence. However, a subsequent search of the property revealed no evidence. Nearly a decade later, in 2005, a 35-year-old man came forward claiming to have witnessed the disposal of Kyle's body when he was just 7 years old. According to his account, Kyle's killer was a man named Ray Hyde, who had died in 2001. The man recounted that Kyle's body had been wrapped in concrete, placed in a barrel, and submerged into a private body of water. He also claimed that his grandfather had assisted in disposing of the barrel and that Hyde had threatened them both. With this new lead, investigators were eventually led to two people. Their names were Jimmy Earl Jones and Jeanne Pollock Johnson. Following this revelation, a man named Jimmy Earl Jones, aged 63, was arrested in April 2005. Then in June of the same year, a woman named Jeanne Johnson was also arrested. Jones was charged with concealing a death, obstructing a criminal's arrest, and two counts of making false statements. As for Johnson, she faced similar charges, including concealing a death, making false statements, and obstructing justice. Several witnesses also claimed to have seen Johnson at Hyde's residence that evening, but she denied these allegations. Investigators later learned that Hyde was a member of the Moose Club suggesting that Hyde and Kyle may have met through that location. It was speculated that Kyle might have been targeted due to his awareness of Hyde's illegal activities. Jones later confessed to the police that on the night Kyle disappeared, he arrived at Hyde's residence and discovered Kyle's lifeless body, revealing that Kyle had been shot. He admitted to assisting Hyde in moving the body to his workshop. Hyde allegedly informed Jones that he had initially disposed of the body in a pond, retrieved it later, and relocated it to an undisclosed location. However, Jones provided conflicting statements to law enforcement, undermining his credibility as a witness. Ultimately, Jones and Johnson both served time in prison for hindering the investigation, but they were never charged with murder. In Casita, Alabama, on December 7th, 2021, a witness notified the police about a car submerged in a creek. After being recovered from the creek that same day, it was confirmed to be Kyle's through its license plate and VIN number. Upon inspecting the car, authorities discovered Kyle's wallet, credit cards, and human remains. Subsequent DNA testing in February of 2023 confirmed the identity of the remains as Kyle's. Despite this identification, the cause of Kyle's death remains unknown. Known. His father passed away in 2007, while his mother passed away in January of 2021. An 11-year-old girl from Newport Beach, California named Linda Ann O'Keefe got up on July 6th, 1973 to prepare for summer school. That day, she wore a white dress made by her mother that was covered with flowers. After eating and saying goodbye to her family, Linda went off to school with her piano teacher, who was responsible for getting Linda to school that morning. Linda was described as a shy kid who enjoyed fine arts including painting and, of course, the piano. She had two sisters that she was very close to as well. At some point after school, when Linda walked back home, she just disappeared. She didn't live very far, and typically, she would even ride her bike to and from school. But again, this time, Linda's piano teacher drove her, and she had to walk back. Nobody found it too strange that Linda hadn't shown up at the usual time, but as minutes turned to hours, her family grew worried. They began to think that maybe Linda was still at school working on some sort of project. So just for safe measure, her family contacted the school to see if Linda was still there. Linda's teacher shared that she had left at the normal time. Her family then went out searching for Linda themselves, but after failing to find her, they called police in fear that she may have been kidnapped. Law enforcement was contacted at about 6.40pm and they searched the area around the school with no sign of the girl. 
Meanwhile, Linda's friends were being reached out to in hopes that one of them had seen her before she disappeared. One of Linda's friends stated that she saw Linda after school. This girl, who I will refer to as Jay, was with her mother in her car when she noticed Linda sitting on the side of the road next to a turquoise van. The presence of this suspicious vehicle made Jay's mother very uneasy, so she parked on the side and wrote down the license plate number of the van. However, it seemed like the driver noticed Jay's mother eyeing the van, so he sped off. At this point, Linda was no longer near the road. She was completely out of sight. But Jay's mother didn't think she saw Linda in the van. Another witness came forward with information later on. This woman lived in Newport Beach near a cliff and said she heard a scream coming from what sounded like a little girl. But since she had no idea that a child was missing, she just thought it was a bunch of kids fooling around and disregarded it. A large search party was created at 7.30 a.m. the next day with both police officers officers as well as volunteers. Around the same time, a dad along with his four-year-old son stopped by a lake to go hunting for frogs. The four-year-old seemed fixated on something in the distance, but the father couldn't tell what. So he looked in the same direction where his son was staring at and walked in a straight line. Eventually, he walked into some cattails and pulled them to the side. Right in front of him was the lifeless body of Linda Ann O'Keefe. The man, not believing the sight, reached out to touch Linda's hand to try and wake her up, but after getting no response, he rushed home with the son and called the police. Once authorities arrived at the lake, they determined that Linda was savagely raped and strangled to death. The investigation continued like most cold cases. There were some leads here and there and some solid suspects, but in the end, no rabbit hole led to a culprit. But then on July 6, 2018, the Newport Police Department came up with an unorthodox way of trying to get new information. They took to Twitter and created a sort of story written from Linda's POV. The first post said, Hi, I'm Linda O'Keefe. 45 years ago today, I disappeared from Newport Beach. I was murdered and my body was found in the back bay. My killer was never found. Today, I'm going to tell my story. Additional tweets were made detailing the day leading up to the moment when she disappeared. I'm wearing a dress today. It's white with light blue flowers on it and dark blue trim. My mom made it. She makes a lot of my clothes and my sister's clothes. She's really good at sewing and we don't have a lot of money for fancy store outfits anyhow. I'm back in the school office and the lady lets me call my mom for a ride home this time. It doesn't go well. She is busy with a sewing project and tells me that I can walk home. It makes me upset and I cry. I'm an easy crier, remember? She knows I was angry about her not picking me up, but she thought I'd sulk a bit and then come home to eat. It's been three hours since she last heard from me, which is a lot when you're a young girl with no lunch in her stomach. Before police made these Twitter posts, they had scientists utilize a technique called DNA phenotyping, which is a method that uses DNA to come up with a likely physical appearance of the owner. So after authorities got the results, they made one final post. But now, 45 years later, I have a voice again, and I have something important to say. There is a new lead in my case, a face. A face that comes from DNA that the killer left behind. It's technology that didn't exist back in 1973, but it might change everything today. Along with a reconstruction of what the culprit may have looked like at the time of the crime, there was an age-progressed version of how he may appear in 2018. Shortly after, the DNA was also submitted to various genealogical facilities, and rather quickly, a potential match was found. The DNA seemed to line up with a man named James Allen Neal, who was 73 years old. After questioning and further investigation, James was arrested in February of 2019 in Colorado before being extradited to Orange County, California. James was not only facing charges involving Linda, but two other girls as well aged around 12 to 14 years old. He pleaded not guilty to the charges, and then in a shocking turn of events, James was hospitalized in May of 2020. Just days later, he ended up dying. So right before he was about to stand trial, his life ended and James didn't have to answer for his crimes. While the case was officially closed with James being the killer, Linda's family, who was still living, carried feelings of anger. You see, Linda's mother and father had passed away. Her mother Barbara died in 2005 and her father Richard in 2008, both of whom never got any sense of closure. In interviews and amongst her family, Barbara stated that she felt immense guilt because of her decision to 
not pick up her daughter from school. Simply wanting to continue a sewing project led to the death of her daughter. She would go on and on, saying that this was the worst mistake she ever made. 